Hello. Victor, how are you? So you've been through this before. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello. This is one of those things we're talking about. It's not going to get better. One last one. So much. Mm. Yeah, we should have done this last night. Uh, Eddie. Fonseca and Mel. Sorry, guys, we were having technical difficulties and I had someone in my office, so I couldn't um, attend to it. I'm glad everyone is here. Hopefully, I'm here to check to you. Let's understand. The ships of goddess isn't an actual goddess. Okay. We don't cringe, then we pray on Kind of good that I had that conversation with uh, the intern previously because she was discussing some of the things that she knows that she got incorrect. And one of them, which I thought was interesting, was a question about a social study, a middle school social studies teacher. She couldn't remember for sure um, the whole scenario. And I believe she tested in July of 2019. She um, says that the scenario was talking about how they were learning about geography and the teacher wanted to um, inf assess them and what would be the best way to um, assess, informally assess them on the knowledge over what they went over. And one was to do a formative assessment. The next one was something that wasn't the answer. The next one was also something that wasn't the answer. And the last one was for her to have a class discussion and the students go up and touch um, different parts on a map before they, they exited and say where it was, before they exited the room. And so based on that, she just, she chose formative because she felt safe in that answer. But remember that they are giving you two okay or good answers, but one is best based on the words and the things that they say in the scenario. So a better informal assessment on what they went over in a social studies class would be for them to point out things uh, or countries or where, to whatever it is, rivers if it were rivers, on a map as they exit and say where it is. In fact, I just saw that in use last week when I was doing my rounds in, San, in the San Antonio classes with the San Antonio students, um, one of my pre-K four, if I'm not mistaken. Oh no, she's not pre-K four. This was a first grade class. Their sight words are on the door for that week. Um, and anytime they leave to go to music, which is specials, or they go to art, or they go to PE, or actually they go to PE every day, or to lunch, whatever the case may be. When they line up, first of all, they have procedures, lots of procedures for that age group because they need it in order to keep any sort of semblance of control. You have to have a, a procedure for pushing in your chair, for lining up a different person that takes care of a different task, like is everybody on their spot? So with the little ones, because they are so willy nilly and wild, they need step-by-step -step instructions. That's something that you should know about, you know, those, those early child years, EC through sixth grade, how, how those students work and what sort of things you would need. But going back to this student and informally assessing them every day, Every day during the week, she puts them, has them up there, and before they leave, um, they have to read it. So they have to say a word and point to it. So she's making them make a connection to a different one. And as she adds the more challenging ones on there throughout the week, some kids get ahead of them because they have the list ahead of time. So they want, they want to, um, or have already learned some of the more challenging words, even though she hasn't put them on the door and they'll, she'll say like, how come you didn't put habitat on there? Or how come you didn't put school on there yet? I wanted to touch that one. So she was like, they are actually showing me that they're ahead already and that's a formative assessment. So what they did was trick her because she felt safe in choosing a formative assessment would be a good way 
to um, identify if the students had learned what she went over. That is true and correct. However, the question asked for the best way for her, for her to assess students over the information that she gave her and the one that was the one the other one was the better one based based on the information that we had so um that's an important thing to remember when you are taking your exam um try to identify what the goal is and remind yourself that if they say best or most then you more than likely have two reasonably good true answers but one is better than the other based on those keywords that you identified and based on the actual goal so sometimes they give you a really great answer choice but the goal is fluency right and the answer choice is a really good thing for you to do activity for you to do for comprehension or for something else but not for fluency so make sure you identify what the goal of the question is so that you can um better eliminate answer choices especially those ones that are going to be very close and very good things that you would do in your classroom so do we have any questions thus far i'm going to take off your microphone because you and mute the audio because usually we mute each other but since um this is sort of a different um did i unmute it i feel like i didn't i wonder if they could hear me though um can you hear me now yes okay great no i was just taking you off mute because mm -hmm. um since this group is has all taken it before i wanted to discuss some of the questions that you remember that maybe you know for a fact you answered incorrectly or you had any questions that way we could sort of target scenarios and competencies and have the this session be that way and then we'll end with some questions to review um, the strategies that i want for you guys to use so if Victor and Melissa, if you can unmute yourself, oh there, unmute, and I'm gonna unmute so that we can have a discussion. So does anyone have a question that they, they remember? Like the scenario that I just gave you right now. Oh, another one that she knows she got wrong. It was a scenario about um, spanking children and how it, a parent went in and and said um i hope i don't get in trouble for talking about this like pearson is really crazy about like talking about tests but so i don't know somebody told me about this scenario but in any event it's important to say that um corporal punishment which is spanking or spanking um the child um as a means of a behavioral deterrent or class management, although not against the law, is up to the districts to decide. And so even though it's not illegal and it's still on the books where like that can be done in education, everybody in education has agreed that that is not helpful and doesn't work. So we as, and then some districts haven't because there are some few that do still have it in their policy. So you have to check back to policy. Go and, and the, I think the law, the Texas law, is that you um, refer back to the school policy, school board policy, which means that school board votes on it, parents go in and debate and they'll say like, you know, heck no, you're not going to be spanking my kids. That's crazy. Like if anyone's going to be spanking them, I'll be spanking them. So you know what? You call me as soon as anything goes down and I will be on top of it because that's my course of action. Um, I'm not, um, would certainly feel uncomfortable having to give out um, corporal punishment. I know that my dad did in his administrative years, but I haven't had to do it in administration and I've never worked for a district that still allows it. So first course of action would be check with district policy 
then let your principal know because you're probably not the one on campus. If it is in your campus policy, you're probably not the one who's designated to give that punishment out. And so it's not going to be you. Um, it'll probably be your principal. That's the way that it was on my campus when I was younger. And I'm sure that part hasn't changed. So people muted themselves again. We're having a discussion. Does anyone remember at all um, something from the last administration that they would like to go over or a particular competency that you would like to think about to ask, like, what would this particular competency look like in a scenario? And I can sort of give you a scenario of something it would look like. Anyone? Okay. Well, this was supposed to be more of like a class session and not a webinar, but it's okay. I understand it's Saturday and I was tardy. So um, not really tardy. We had crazy difficulties. I don't, I don't remember so many questions. <laughs> you don't, but do you remember what sort of kind of questions gave you difficulties? Like, was it having dealing with technology? Was it dealing with classroom management? Was it more about assessments? I want to say it was more, um, there's some questions that you actually have to like answer three or four or five questions that has to do with a paragraph. And then, you know, I have to go back or you read it and I mean, I try, I think I get them right, but then I don't know if I get them or not. So those like those and maybe, I mean, we went over the ELAs last time that helped a lot. And that's about maybe class scenarios. They're, they're fine. I mean, I think it's only, I want to say, the ELA, ELLs, maybe the assessments and just tricky questions. I mean, just to go over questions and answers and certain words that, you know, are positive or negative, you know, something like that. Right. Um, the, here it is. I'm trying to get to where the competencies are. So domain one is designing um, effective instruction and assessments, right? Continuous assessments, because you have, you can't just give assessments like at the end of the week, that teacher that I was telling you about that I went to go and I was like, whoa, with her informal assessments that she does every single time she leaves. So her kids are like way ahead of the game and they're way ahead of the game because she made it a fun little thing. And they're like eager to know and be able to touch more of the challenging ones. So she got them intrinsically motivated. She's doing all the right things. So when I went in there to appraise her as far as like what the teaks or what her professional responsibility, she's doing so great. So informal assessments, um, creating lots of opportunities for them to show you what they know and lots of opportunities for you to look at and form, which is what formative assessments do, to form the adjustment or the planning or the implementing of your lessons. So we give those assessments, not just so we can give them a grade and say, oh, you did well or not, but to also think, okay, is this working? Did they not understand? Did they not get the concept? Um, do I need to go back and reteach some of them? Maybe some of them need to be retaught because they learn in a different way. Maybe they're auditory learners or visual learners. And all I have to do to make it more effective and make it to where more people are, are doing well on my informal assessments is to add visuals to it or to add some sort of audio some aspect to it or tactile. So it's going back. It's not just about informally assessing them so that you can give them a grade in your grade book. It's about finding out if what you're doing is working for your goals in your classroom and what you need to do to, to make it better. If you only have six out of 10 kids doing well, how can you make it eight? Can you adjust it a little bit to make it eight? Once you make it eight, look at it again. What is it specifically about those kids that is making them not be able to identify the right place on the map or be able to point out some of the harder words. If you recognize that your first graders are only choosing, you know, some of the easier words from the beginning, then you might need to help out or 
lose their confidence or whatever the case may be, look at that student in particular. So I know that when we're in the classroom, it's hard to do that because you have 160 kids, right? You have 160 kids. So um, it's really important that you think about and find different ways, easy ways for you to create a picture. So for instance, um, you can't only assess them based on whether or not they can touch those words. So you have to, they should be using them in a sentence, drawing a, a picture using that story or creating a story using those words and then drawing pictures with it or doing all these different ways using those words to show you that they have mastery of that because that's how you're able to paint a picture and say, okay, I can assess them and, and they're ready for this next level of stuff. That way, when I do a summative assessment, which is after all the learning has taken place, which is for us, our state exam, the star test, um, and whatever district benchmarks you have, but really in all reality, it's the, the star exam because that's how schools get rated. And, and that's what the TEKS are aligned to. So um, making sure that you recognize how those standards work, the point of it all is important because just going through and memorizing these things is not going to get you to be an effective teacher. And so for the grade, for this exam, for this test, they want you to do it theory-based. And even though it's not possible for us to do all of these things every day, in theory, we should be trying to do all of these things every single day. Life happens, people leave, um, there's a meltdown, the, the lesson didn't go as, as it should have, but we always regroup, look at what went wrong, we self-assess the, how the class went, and then make changes based on their human development, based on, um, different characteristics of the students that impact their learning. So it, you might have students who have, and I don't know if that is cognitive, you might have students that have special needs already. Um, and if, it's, if it is specifically stated in the test question that they have special needs, then please believe me that that is important information and that you need to be aware of how we um, accommodate our special ed students. And so if they mention that they're ELL, that's important. You're supposed to make a, um, or at least be aware that that is a thing that may or may not be important because I have seen them try to trick a student and, and our students in some of their questions. Excuse me, in some of their questions. So the scenario had um, ELL students, and one of the answer choices is something that you would most definitely do for ELLs, but the goal of the question was not ELLs per se. It was why you would, the, the scenario was they're teaching this, they te teaches this to everyone, but why is this good also for ELL students? So it was, he does it for everyone. And the reason he does it for everyone is the same reason why you would want to do it for ELLs. So it was a trick question, but they give you, it, or you should pay attention to the keywords, identify them so that you can identify where in the competency you need to ascertain or assess important information. So let me look at it. Very different. So what, what things, um, have you taken a look at your scores and seen if there's any correlation, like maybe domain three has given you a problem each time? Or has it, have you just been all over the place each time? Most people have difficulty in domains one and three. Domain one, domain one is planning, creating and planning lessons and assessments that are continuous and that are effective. Um, and then domain three is implementing. Okay, so you've created this awesome plan for all of these different things with all of these different things in mind. Now show me how are you going to implement them in your classroom? to meet the needs of all of these different students. So that is why domain one, domain one and domain three give people such a difficult time. Um, 
Domain two has to do with your class environment, it has to do with um, creating a culture of learning, creating a culture of acceptance, creating a culture that values diversity, that um, uplifts diversity, and that gives and shows students that diversity is not something that is bad or that is a negative, that it is a positive. And I always gave my students crazy examples of why diversity is so important, even on a cellular like molecule level. So um, creating that classroom environment of learning is really important. Making everybody feel accepted is really important, especially in today's age with our political climate and everything that's going on. It's really important that our students know that everybody is important, everyone can learn, everyone is equal. If you come from another country, there is nothing wrong with you. If you speak another language, it means that you're smarter than the average bear because you use more of your brain, that is fact and science. So creating that positive culture in the beginning, creating, if you, especially if you have early child students, creating procedures and policies within your classroom that will make your class more manageable. You have to have, you know, things, procedures for lining up, procedures for sitting down, procedures for getting in groups or changing specials or small group learning. Um, all of those things to keep you your your life and your sanity going a lot smoother. You don't need so many of them when you're doing high school, but you still need procedures for stuff because if not, you'll just have a whole bunch of teenagers walking around aimlessly and it is insane. So if there's like a rhyme and a reason, then the students can work and they can master your goals better. So yeah, uh, it's been different all three times, I think, because they are the biggest. Okay, so it's been very different all three times. Yeah, it is because they're the biggest sections. It's the, it's the biggest section for you to get um, tested over. So, um, so recognize the rationale for appropriate middle level education, how middle level schools are structured to address the characteristics and the needs of young adolescents so with middle school students i only did when i taught and i taught public school for 14 years and then i have taught um teachers and been an administrator for four so it's been I have seen a lot of things and I, but I have never done elementary and I know that with middle age students, you still sort of have that elementary feel to it. I never did sixth grade because I never wanted to do. I know a lot of people love doing it, but those people who love doing sixth grade is because they love elementary a lot. Like they love doing a lot of baby stuff and they love it that there's, they still need a lot of structure. They're, they haven't shifted out completely of that elementary mode in sixth grade. Seventh and eighth grade, they're trying to find themselves, they're testing the waters, they're unsure about their identity. And so, but you, they're more adultish. They're, they're putting their toe in the water of their adult self. And I like it. I like doing that and I like being a positive molder when they're in that age group. So I never did sixth grade, I did seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And, and those middle age kids need a lot of activities that bolsters their confidence and that shows them that difference okay. They're very unsure of themselves at that time. And if they don't have positive role models or somebody telling them good information at the house, then they're going to learn the wrong things. And right now they're learning to be who they're going to be later, or they're finding out people are different. Listen, I don't have to be like, maybe like my dad, if his dad, if the dad is not a good um, role model, I could be like this. So it's really important that we take that all of those things into consideration when we're creating our lessons that we, that we, do things particularly that would benefit our students become better people, not just learn in our class, but become better humans. And at the same time, you're, they will do better in your class well, if, you're, if you're taking the time to, to do that. So they'll become better humans and then therefore they'll do better in your class. Um, are there any questions so far?
And is there anything, any competency in particular that you would like me to go over? Anybody? You wanna go over competency one? Or domain one? Yes, that's fine. Okay. The teacher understands human development process and applies this skill to plan instruction and ongoing assessment that motivates the students and are responsible, uh, responsive to their developmental characteristics and needs. So we wanna engage the student. We don't just want to do direct instruction. Imagine if our, if our elementary teachers say at second grade, in order to teach science, stood in front of the class and lectured, just read out of the textbook. I had some teachers do that when I was in elementary, actually, and it was pretty boring. But I remember when we did um, like fun little activities, those are the ones that I remembered the most when we planted our lima bean and then we all watched it grow and then the peoples who's died they had a, a meltdown in class because it died but at that age level sitting and reading out of a book developmentally we are incapable of doing it as that early child and so being able to understand the stages of cognitive development and let me pull up for you the cheat sheet Sorry. So I have five children. I don't know if I've said that before, but so I have five children and I'm a, I am work full time and I'm going through this awful, horrific divorce. It's like the worst ever. So it seems like sometimes on some days, everything just goes completely wrong. And today was one of those days. And the, it's not coming up. It's called Quick Sheet. The, Zoom app wasn't working and then um, but a student came in in person but she came in just to tell me she wasn't going to be able to stay in person and then um, we started talking until I could get this thing so, so that she takes her test next week in two days. How many of you are testing next week? I'm sorry I'm, it's not coming. Is anybody testing next week already? Or did you have to do this session in order to be eligible for the attempt? I want to register for next week. Okay, well, you'll be able to register by Monday. Um, Mr. Vio doesn't work on the weekends. I'm the only one who works on the weekends. Um, but he will certainly do that for you on Monday. He'll open up the exam. But so, but I want for you to honestly, you know, we talk about the students and, and we, the, the key ways to self-assess, right? Mm -hmm. To look at yourself and see what do I need to do? What do I need more time? I cannot tell you, and they always ask me, how do you think they did? Do you think we should open it? And my, and I turn around and ask the student, you need to be honest with yourself because what we go over mostly is, yes, I will explain concepts and, and the competencies, elaborate on them, but when we do the study sessions with the questions, we just go over testing strategies. They didn't tell me, did you anything before I signed up? Yeah, this will definitely count in order for you to be able to sign up for it. So, but, but what I'm saying is that when you do sign up for it, if you don't sign up for next week, if, you're, if you know that there are holes in your mastery of this stuff and by this stuff let's take a look at competency one so we just read what competency one is and here is on the cheat sheet I call it a cheat sheet which is why I couldn't find it on the hard drive it's listed as quick sheet but this was this great um, notes that I got from a student and teachers like to borrow from each other so I wanted this for my students they don't sell it or else I would have you know asked you to buy it 
so I don't have to send copywritten information, but they don't even make it anymore. Piaget's theory of cognitive development, their physical development and maturity from three to four year olds, they're high energy. You can't just have them sit there and you read them a story the whole time. They barely are gonna make it through one short story. They won't. You'll have some of them messing with each other. It's crazy, which is why I never did. Um, elementary, but I love going on the campuses and looking at how other people are able to do it. And those having procedures in place, having a, a little procedure for when kids are off topic, like one teacher had, um, he would say, okay, little, um, okay, little mechanics, flat tire. And they'd go, shh. And everyone would be quiet. And it was awesome. It was completely silent. And so he would say, okay, okay, little mechanics. And everyone would go, shh. And there would be no talking immediately. It was so cool. But he had several of those little things and he switched it up and he didn't make it boring and they liked it. So depending on what your age group is, depending on where they are cognitively, socially, where they are on their Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I've had students where I found out that they were, didn't have food at home because you know it was the first of the month they were poor it wasn't like a neglect thing it was like they had only a little bit so they only ate at dinner there were no snacks he wanted to take some of the food back home the snacks that we had in class back home with him and so i never knew that about him luckily it was early on in the school year it was it was the first time we ever benchmarked them so it was in the first six weeks but that made a difference to how I interacted with him and the things that I planned out and the things that I did in the classroom. It, it helped form, it was a, an assessment of source of his hierarchy of needs even, but it, it helped me create instruction differently for, not just for him, but I took that in mind when I created the things that I did. So that's the sort of thing that you need to keep in your brain when you are um, going through the lessons. So whenever they ask you to analyze, or well, they're not gonna ask you to do that, but they'll give you a developmental characteristic of early childhood maybe, and um, you'll have to choose uh, maybe a strategy or a different assessment that would best assess them at that level where they are. You wouldn't give an assessment to a senior that you would a pre-K four student. You just wouldn't. So early child all the way to 12th grade. That's a lot of different kids, a lot of different ways that you would assess them on anything. Where are they emotionally? Are they having a bad day? Even that you would assess them sort of differently. So um, going through your competencies, highlighting things that you don't understand and, I, and looking them up is important. Or asking me. If the parents are going through a divorce, then you might need to do different things in classroom management pertaining to that. So if they mention it, it might may or may not be important. So use knowledge of cognitive changes in students in early childhood through adolescence. So you go from a more of a concrete when you're younger, you have to see it. You have to watch the lima bean grow. You can't just read about it in a textbook. You can read about it in a textbook when you're in college which is why they just make us read, read chapter one and then come back in and we're gonna do talk about it or something. But we can see how the systems of the body work abstractly in our brain after reading it because we've learned how to do that. We've been trained and our mind is better at doing that abstract thinking. When they're younger, they need concrete, physical, let's do a something where we're working with our hands or we see it visually and we actually do it. So knowing those changes and how to plan for that is important. Recogn recognize developmental delays or impairments. So know at what age students start reading what time what age they start spelling correctly everyone needs to know that anyway because it's part of everyone's job to make sure that our ELL students are getting that they are getting um 
adequate vocabulary instruction and that you are improving their reading fluency, that they're listening, they're speaking, they're reading and they're writing fluency within your content area. Everyone should be doing that. And that just means providing them with vocabulary from your content area, providing them with um, even vocabulary for stuff that if you, if it's a beginner, then they might not have the vocabulary for, um, give me an example of the last time you watered the grass. Maybe they don't know what water the grass is. And so you would have to define for a beginner what water the grass is, if that is part of the assignment and you're gonna talk about how I don't know what you were talking about watering the grass. Maybe the best time of day to water grass and why the science behind it. But in any event, you might have to define things in that very basic sentence because the, the beginner student does not have um, the BICS yet, that basic interpersonal communication uh, skills. So we have to build that and everyone should be building it at every grade level, wherever you are. So you know what is appropriate for a beginner student who's in the first grade, you know what's inappropriate for a beginner student that's in, at 12th grade, you know, and what, what sort of things you might have to translate for them in order for them to be successful in your class. So this domain one is about the planning and taking all of their physical human traits and applying that into stellar, effective, motivating, and the way to get them motivated intrinsically means knowing who you have. If you, if you have uh, students um, who are predominantly border students like we do, then we know what kind of stuff speaks to them. If you go and um, speak to your history teacher, you can get, you can get ideas how to connect with what they're already learning and get ideas for um, prior knowledge that way. And, and that will help build your learning and also make connections to other content areas. Significance of student diversity for teaching, learning, and assessment, not just ethnicity related to gender, language, background, exceptional, exceptionability, if you have brilliant students, if you have a rich student and a poor student, do not let students choose their own groups. You have to carefully craft your groups so that you take that into account, so that you put the poor kid with the rich kid, with the kid who speaks perfect English and perfect Spanish and the beginner ELL student in there and have them all work together in a group to figure something out that is fun and cool so that they know they're all just kids together. They're all just fourth graders in a fourth grade classroom. So it's really important that we, um, like I said before, when I was discussing domain two, which is your, your classroom, creating that positive classroom environment where students can learn and everybody feels respected and they're safe and they're growing. Um, part of that is, is making sure that everyone knows that diversity is something to be um, applauded, that it is a good thing. And I tell my students, I used to tell my students, I don't tell them anymore, but um, I read some years ago, and now it's actually a real, real thing that a lot of people do, but then it was like a crazy thing. I still think it's a crazy thing. It's where I draw the line in the sand, but people are getting enemas, which means um, they, they shoot, they're getting poop enemas. They're taking the, it's like not literally somebody's poop, but it sort of is. It comes from their poop, and what they're doing is they're introducing diverse intestinal bacteria or flora in order to make people healthier. And apparently it does wonders. As someone who suffers from fibromyalgia, I'm always reading about like ways to cure myself. And that was something that people said they experienced like better bowel movements. And Eve biodiversity is important in order for things to um, not go extinct and to not get sick and die off. And that includes even with conversations, you need to have people from different perspectives to, in order for things to grow and things to get better. So creating that, that environment, but also remembering that being diverse in your classroom means that you're trying to hit different students' strengths. So are you doing things that will um, speak to an auditory learner or will, are you reaching the visual learner? Are you 
having um, moments and breaks for that student that has a lot of energy or that person who needs tactile and needs to get up and make things and do projects with their hands. So are, are you doing diverse instructional strategies? Are you doing diverse instructional activities to meet the multiple intelligence and the multiple learning styles of your specific student population? And it takes a lot of work which is why I will get into an argument with anyone who talks down about the teaching profession because it's one of the most like sort of shit on profession and we do so much, we take so much into account. My students uh, that I'm friends with now, they're all adults. I think this is the last year that I have students in public school and, and they're seniors. So. Um, none of those students are friends with me on social media, but I always told them if they were adults that I would definitely add them. Um, and I love seeing them do awesome things. They're like dentists and lawyers are like doing better than me and I love it. Um, but you create a bond if you do it right and they learn from you if you do it right. They will do anything for you if you do it right. Um, and doing it right means team building in the beginning, getting to know your students, knowing their needs, whether they're cognitive, behavioral, because you will have, they will have behavioral needs. I had some students who just needed more attention and that didn't mean that they were, I was going to give them negative attention, but I would definitely find ways to make, give them positive attention for doing things that I wanted for them to do. And it might've taken a little bit extra work for them, but they still wanted the attention and they still went for it and it made them grow. So it makes your life easier if you learn your students, you learn how they learn best, and then you promote those things by adding them into your lesson. So that's all it is. That's all these competencies are. When you read them, make sure that you think about them in that way because I'm gonna have to let you guys go um, in negative five minutes, which was, I should have let you go five minutes ago, I'm so sorry. But does anyone have any questions? We will have another session probably next Saturday. Um, and I will make sure that I don't have any technical difficulties. Does anyone have anything to say? Any questions, comments? Absolutely, absolutely. If you have any questions, shoot me an email or a text message. And um, if you, I'm gonna let everybody, oh, let me take roll, I'm so sorry. I didn't write down everyone who attended today. Let me take um, roll, I don't know how else to say it. Let me take attendance, so silly. <clears throat> mm. We are Saturday the 14th, and Chris Gutierrez did not, I have the people who were supposed to attend. Vanessa didn't attend. Oh, nobody that was supposed to attended. Okay, um, Victor, thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you, thank you for everything. Of course. Thank you for patiently waiting. I honestly was hoping against hope that you guys would have. But I, did, I wasn't sure. I was like, no, they probably didn't. But I was just going to try anyway. All right, guys, y'all are so awesome. Thank you so much for coming in on a Saturday. And remember, take a look at the uh, at the competencies, but also don't forget about the standards one through five, those technology standards. Make sure you go through them and that you can, with a little bit of com confidence, talk about the different concepts that, that are there, like a Boolean search. Like if you don't know what a Boolean search is, Google it and then write it on your printout off there, a Boolean search is this. Cause that for sure is something that you are supposed to know as a, as a Texas teacher, because things have changed. Before when I started teaching, we didn't even take grades on the internet. We did everything by hand and, and the way that we use technology has changed a lot in education. So you are supposed to be knowledgeable. And if you aren't at that level, 
for sure go through those standards and competencies, do a, a critical reading of it and annotate, it, uh, and annotate your text and, and mark out if, I mean, write a definition. Like if you don't know what something means, if you can't explain it to someone with confidence and you don't know what it is, Google it, write a little summary off to the side, which is a way that we gauge our learning and thinking. It's kind of what we want the students to do and I'm asking you to do it because it is a, an effective learning strategy. So I will see you guys at the next meeting and have a beautiful rest of your weekend. Stop video, stop share, stop the meeting.